Hello and welcome to uh, Evolvepreneur's show, <clears throat> secret show for uh, for uh, entrepreneurs. Pardon me there for stumbling it, or through that. I'm going to try that again. Welcome to the Evolvepreneur uh, secret show for entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Brian Silverthorne, and I apologize for uh, stepping on my own tongue there for a minute. Um, my mission is to help entrepreneurs... Uh, achieve what they'd like to achieve and overcome the obstacles that uh, are very common with startups and growth and and or re, re, uh, relaunching a business. And today we're going to dig deep with our guest and uh, get some great concepts and strategies to help you fast track your business. And our special guest today is uh, Ami Devereaux, and she's president of Beyond Better. And they offer executive uh, coaching and strategy consulting to high growth funded startups. And I'm going to let uh, Ami give us her origin story here. And she's got a very extensive and impressive bio. So I think she'll be better to cover it on, on her own than me doing it. So welcome to the show, Ami. Thank you, Brian. I'm delighted to be here. Um, well, I don't know how long an origin story I'm going to give you because I could go on for a really long time since I'm older than the average startup. Um, but I, uh, many eons ago, was a professional dancer. And I was unemployed a lot, as you might imagine. I was living in London, had quit a PhD, went back to dancing professionally. And dancers are unemployed periodically. So I ended up with a fitness business because I taught aerobics. And that business was a consulting company that put fitness centers in organizations, most of which were big investment banks. They were U.S. investment banks based in London, and they would implement a fitness center and then measure the ROI based on reductions in absenteeism and improvements in morale and stuff like that. So it seemed to me like a really great idea to bring that idea to America where there was group health insurance. And I thought I would be able to do a deal with health insurance companies. And like so many subsequent things that happened in my life, it was an abject failure. So I ended up with this personal training business. I hated personal training because it was essentially glorified babysitting and gossiping. And I uh, sold it to my employees who were much better at it than I was. And I then took a job running a little company at the time called the National Inline Hockey Association as the second in command, which was the governing body for a brand new sport called roller hockey at the time. And um, in the meantime, I'd been doing this little part-time gig doing radio. And I got a call from out of the blue to take my little part-time radio show and go full-time syndicated across the country which was one of those things like if you're an actor and Robert Redford calls and says, we're looking to do a movie, Sundance wants you as the lead, are you in? I couldn't say no to. So I left my job running this company and moved across the state and ended up on the air. And then a year later, despite the great success of this show, the station got purchased and I was out on my proverbial backside with no prospects, having having hired my um, successor into the previous job as the COO. That company had since been sold to the National Hockey <laughs> League, which was a little disheartening that I missed that boat. But I ended up being um, recruited into a consulting firm. And I became a partner in that firm. We did strategy consulting and organizational change. We had a proprietary approach and I was a partner for about seven or eight years. And in that time, we discovered that organizational change was a useless endeavor unless you attacked the strategy. And that was a really big insight for us because our entire business was based on the proposition that if you transform human beings in an organization, you will transform organizational results. And that turned out not to be true. So my partner and I went back to the drawing board and became experts in strategy. And we became, uh, in particular, we, we found strategy mapping and balanced scorecards. We developed an expertise in it. We used our extensive backgrounds as facilitators and, and coaches 
and developed a proprietary way to do strategic planning. I left the firm to go out on my own, did that for a number of years, and then the Great Recession hit. Now, there's a reason why I'm telling you this part of the story, because when the recession hit, and we're expecting another one in about a year, my business vanished because the very first thing that every company gets rid of when they're trying to cut is consultants. And I was left with a business that had no clients, with no revenue, and no unemployment and no safety net because I was self-employed. And at that time, I got broken up that I was completely without shame. And the St. Petersburg Times, which is now called the Tampa Bay Times, asked if I would be part of a story called, and I'm paraphrasing, something like, here are the people you wouldn't believe can't get a job. And I was one of the people in the story. And my whole resume was there and all my background. And that landed me a job running a startup for little, for too little money. And I was charged with writing the strategy, creating the business and securing the funding from the holding company. And I led that startup for a year. We got it acquired a year later. And then that acquisition, I was retained with my team to run that company, which is called Ringo, which is in the UK, the brand leader in mobile payment for parking. And I ran that company until the holding company pulled out of the US because they didn't want to raise more money in the US. And so they went back to the UK and folded the American company. I was a hired leader, I wasn't the founder. And that sent me right back to the consulting world, but now with an expertise in running high growth tech startups. And that's what I do now. I work with the leaders and found the founders and leaders of high growth tech startups, those that have already gotten at least a round of funding on scaling their company, scaling their strategy and scaling their people at the rate that their actual growth is taking place. And that brings us to the present reality. Wow, well, that is a uh, rather interesting story. A lot, of, I mean, similar in a lot of ways to, to people that uh, uh, run into unforeseen failures. And if they're paying attention, they, they learn from them and move on, which it sounds like you did in, in an excellent way. So now that you're in your particular area of expertise, how do you, uh, go about attracting new business? Well, initially, when I came back to consulting, I decided to offer coaching as a separate line of business. So I had strategy consulting, which was what I had been doing for 20 years, but I had always, we had always offered executive coaching. It just wasn't sold as executive coaching. It was rolled into strategy engagements. So I decided that it was gonna be a quicker business or sales cycle to sell coaching because an individual could make a decision. So I started by selling executive coaching and I put myself online, on LinkedIn, on Facebook and um, on a, a couple of coaching sort of, cat, you know, uh, they're like white pages for coaches or yellow pages. And I got a few clients that way, not tons. And I didn't know anything about selling coaching. I didn't know what to charge. I didn't know how to attract clients. I didn't know any of that, but I got a couple of clients. And to be perfectly honest, almost every subsequent client has come at least somewhat through referral. Now, that's not to say that I don't do anything to grow the business. I do copious quantities of content. I've been publishing a blog for six years. Um, I have a 7,000 person subscriber list that grew organically. I have over 9,000 contacts on LinkedIn. I have 12,000 Twitter followers, but that has all been developed entirely through thought leadership. I don't advertise. I don't do um, specials particularly. I don't send any marketing material to my list other than banners on the newsletter that goes out. But that's a very slow way to grow a business. And I can imagine, and I have had this experience, it's too slow. And so I'm currently exploring some other things, but I haven't got enough data to tell you how well they're going to do. So um, at the moment, right now, that's the model that works. And the accelerated model is sort of 
to be de determined, but I'm happy to come back in six months and let you know how it's going. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard when you're doing the work and then have to, to uh, carve out pieces of time to actually do the marketing. And then if you have it on multiple platforms around there, it makes it that much more difficult to control. So it's, uh, I mean, I, when I was doing consulting and way back in the day and, and uh, uh, working with other consultants, we, we all kind of mutually agreed that we'd probably give up 40% of our income just to have somebody else do the marketing because our <laughs> income would probably go up exponentially anyway to, to bring us some nice warm leads. So um, when you get a, a client and you're working with them, what do you think, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever given them to help them with their startup? To decide what not to do. Okay. And I think that's the best advice you can give anyone who's trying to do anything. That's whether you are a startup growing a you know fast trajectory organization or whether you're a solo printer growing your business. And that's part of the reason that when I say the only way I've grown my business is through content and referral, I don't actually do things on all those different platforms. I have Twitter automated. I have Facebook automated. I have linked, uh, LinkedIn mostly automated because I just repurposed the content from my newsletter. And I essentially spend my energy on producing the thought leadership and educating myself so that I constantly have more value to give my clients. And what I see in most organizations, and this goes for, as I said, even just solo entrepreneurs, is that they try to do everything. Every opportunity looks like a shiny object that needs to be exploited. And I, and it's easy to understand why, right? When you see something that seems an opportunity, you're afraid that if you don't go for it, you're leaving money on the table and that the other things you're doing might fail. And then you didn't do this one thing. And it feels like you have to do everything, but you can't. And what happens is that particularly I see this in startups and I'm talking about startups that have a hundred, two hundred million dollars in funding who are literally chasing their tails because they can't say no to any opportunity. The CEO is like a magpie who sees shiny objects everywhere. And consequently, the strategy and the business model changes every other week to a new vertical, a new initiative, a new way of purposing the product, a change in the roadmap. And what that does is it causes um, essentially a cannibalism of your own resources, both your cognitive resources, your human resources, and your expertise, because you're not expert in anything then. You're just always learning and trying to figure out how to do the new thing. And solopreneurs do it all the time. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I hear that a lot too, where the, a lot of people want to be all things to all people. I even had a consultant tell me once when he asked for help, I said, well, what is it that you do? He said, well, I really can't tell you everything I can do. I need to show you. So that, that's why people need to hire me. <laughs> yeah, so obviously that's not working too well for you. Otherwise you wouldn't have come to me. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think maintaining a pretty sharp focus on what you want to do. You, once you get in and have a proof of concept, do what you do well, you can always expand from there. So yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's quite all right. Jump in. Well, I mean, and I think with consultants, it's especially dangerous because of course, if you're a consultant, you know about a lot of different aspects of business. But I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm on a service that gives me leads and 80% of the consulting leads want some kind of process or operational consulting. And to be honest, could I fake it? Absolutely. But that's not what I do. I'm not an expert at that. That's not my passion. I don't have tons of experience in it. And so it's hard to say no to a lead that just popped into my inbox and somebody is actively looking for somebody who can reduce their costs and increase their ROI. And, you know, maybe I could even make the case that I could do it, but why would I build my portfolio with projects that aren't the ones that I am the very best at? Right. And it, but it is hard. It's really hard to say no. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, what what is it uh, that you'd like to accomplish in this this next year going forward? Um, I'm planning to launch a couple of courses. I haven't done that yet, 
Um, my business has remained pretty purely, mostly retained coaching. So like I work with a startup organization and I'm available to coach multiples of the leaders um, and the consulting, the strategy consulting. But I'm looking to actually launch a few virtual courses for a few reasons. One is I see them as being annuities, right? They're they're automatic. They can make money while I'm not there. I only have to attend for, let's say, a mastermind group or some kind of, you know, feature of Kieran's. I don't have to lead the course once I lead it. Um, so that's on my list for the next year. And um, I'm also looking at transitioning some of my clients to an online platform, which I also don't do right now. I do a very kind of classic telephone conversation coaching, and I do mostly on-site, occasionally virtual strategic planning off-sites that include the development of a strategy map and a balanced scorecard and offer ongoing coaching and support for the implementation of the strategy. So adding these automated kinds of opportunities is a big change, and it means developing evergreen interactive content, even though I have a lot of evergreen sort of thought leadership content, I don't have any evergreen interactive content. And that's a big challenge and I'm trying to wrap my mind around what that would look like and how I can do something distinct from all the billions of other courses that are already out there. Right. Right. What what do you what do you see? I mean that's that's a lot. That's ambitious planning for sure. It's not all gonna happen at once. There's gonna be oh, like one I, course I, and one other interactive offering. <laughs> right. I understand. But what uh, what do you think is the is the biggest hurdle that you need to get over to get one or more of those done? Well, for one thing, as you saw at the moment, I have Bell's palsy, and so I'm probably not. I would I think had I not gotten this, I would have been literally recording the course over the summer during my quiet season. But I don't want to record the course right now while I'm disfigured and my speech is a little bit impaired. So that's kind of delayed things. I don't know when this is going to go away. Um, so that's a big hurdle is just get, and I don't have any control over that. Right. Yeah. You know, the one that I do have some control over is developing the content and that I made some strides on. I'm actually looking at developing a course about strategy in particular. And at the moment, what I'm working on is strategy for downtimes. So most people do what I did, which is they go into a recession doing little more than trying to survive. And there are very few businesses of any size that thrive. In fact, according to HBS, about 7% thrive in a recession and about 80% don't even regain their former rate of growth until three years after a recession. So the question of, given that we have advance notice that we're gonna have a recession or at least a lot more turbulence, the question of how to develop a strategy that will have you thrive in that challenging period of time, I think is both essential for businesses right now and something that nobody else is really doing. And I have some insight into it. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like a very valuable uh, information source to mm -hmm. because everybody. Most people don't, at least most people in my experience, I'm not going to make a general overall statement, but they don't pay a close enough attention to the market to see bad things coming, even when they're headlines in the newspaper. And right. they haven't really got a strategy uh, set up to deal with that, to make changes and, and pivot, whatever the common term is. And, and if you uh, had a strategy to not only see how things are coming and also how to prepare to... Uh, to respond when things do come, I, I can see that as being a, a, a huge benefit. Um, yeah. And then once you get the course uh, situated, then then you've got to get it out there to the right people, right? Yeah, um, I'm less worried about that than I am actually about just developing the product. Because as I said, I, I am fortunate enough that I've built somewhat of a following. And, you know, I don't need millions of people to do the course. What I need is a core group that love it yeah. and that will then spread it. And so that's why the, the quality of the product is so important, that it not be some kind of, you know, thing you could have gotten on a LinkedIn free course or, you know, by going on Twitter and just going to somebody's YouTube channel. 
I mean, I do YouTube videos, but mine are nine minutes long. They're not in depth. You know, this is going to be really step by step how to do the right analysis, how to do the second order of thinking, what's the kind of thinking you need to do as you predict eventualities and how to seize opportunities from the mess that there will un almost undoubtedly be. And some companies have done a good job for, of it. So there are, there are, there is, are cases out there to look at and understand how others before us were thinking about it. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's always good to uh, learn from other people's mistakes and experiences rather than having to go through it all yourself. So I think that's Absolutely. a wonderful, wonderful idea. So we're getting toward the end here. Do, uh, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or do you have any final thoughts? Um, well, I mean, I could talk, we could talk forever, but um, no, I mean, I think, I think if people could actually use even a little bit that we said about planning for the recession, they mm -hmm. could make a difference in their own business. That is to say, if your inclination right now is as you look out at the future to assume that economic times are going to either continue as they are or get slightly worse. And what you're thinking about doing is, you know, hoarding cash and trying to streamline your business and keep your existing clients. That's not a bad strategy for survival. And that is what, you know, when we think a hurricane's coming, I live in Florida, you buy lots of water and you board up your windows and yeah, you, you plan for survival. But maybe if you were planning to thrive, what you would do instead is you would go buy a property in, you know, Minnesota and turn it into an Airbnb in the winter and then go there when there's a hurricane and have an evacuation plan so that you would have monetized your emergency pre preparation. And so when you look at your own business, if you take that kind of thinking, try to predict the what ifs. Let's say interest rates go up. What does that do to your credit line? What does that do to your cash flow? What can you do? And let's say your cash flow goes down and your, your management of your debt goes up. Then what? What do you have to give up? Now, if you ask all those questions, you're going to arrive at a point where there's a decision node. And at that decision node, you could create a plan to exploit what's happening in the economy instead of to have it exploit you. And I really think that just taking that little bit of advice could give your audience a tool with which they could thrive in any kind of conditions that come next. I think that's that's very good, very strong advice to to exploit what's happening in the economy rather than have it exploit you. Uh, that that is a big nugget, and also your nugget about uh, uh, staying focused. Find out what you or or admit what you don't do or don't want to do, and focus on the things that you do do well, and and make the most of those. So I really well, and decide what you're not going to pursue. Yeah. Get rid of some of those opportunities. You can't chase them all well. Excellent. Well, Ami, this has been very uh, beneficial and very helpful. Um, there's a lot of good information here. And I really appreciate you taking the time with us. And I wish you the best with your uh, all your <laughs> ventures that you have planned. Thank you so much, Brian. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you again.